Well, good morning. It's, it's so good to be together, isn't it? Um, my belief, and I think our belief in student development is this, this has the potential to bring out the best of us here at Biola as a community. So that's our hope and our prayer today. And so as most of you know by now, our dear friend Haseyat Joy Nagash went to be with the Lord on January 15th. She was on a mission trip in India uh, over interterm and she collapsed and passed away from a severe asthma attack. Our community has been suffering ever since, and we will continue to do so. And like Kyle mentioned, whether or not you feel the direct pain of this, we know and acknowledge that whenever one part of the body suffers, we all suffer, and we suffer with those who mourn. There's gonna be a memorial service for Joy Thursday, next Thursday, February 5th at 7 p.m. right here in the gym. And of course, all of you are invited to that to process more. This is gonna be a time to focus on Joy's life, what she gave to us and her teammates and her friends. But also it's gonna be a time for us to recenter ourselves. Ourselves on the foundational reality of the resurrection. It's in the Apostles' Creed, we believe it. And so we can circle the wagons around it. That life has always sprung from death in God's kingdom. And that now joy is in the immediate loving presence of God. You know, she has never known such direct love as she's experiencing right now. And she will experience resurrection in her body as Jesus was the first to. In what Paul calls an imperishable body, when God recreates the new earth and it's heaven. And so we anticipate that. But for us now, there is sadness and grief, and for some of us who knew her well, there is great sadness and grief. But Paul writes that we do not grieve as those without hope. In 1 Thessalonians 4.14, it says that you must not carry on over those who have passed away, like people who have no hope, to look forward to as if the grave were the last word. Since Jesus died and broke loose from the grave, God will most certainly bring back to life those who died in Christ. And still we grieve and we must carry on. And this morning, we wanna have some family time, just us as a community. I'm glad that so many of you are here. And we're gonna explore what it might look like to grieve as those who have this kind of hope. As Kyle mentioned, for many of you, the loss of joy has resulted in a direct feeling of sadness. Those of you who knew her and are, are just feeling the loss, it's direct and it's clearly, and there's no question for you that you'll carry this pain in your hearts for quite some time. For some of you, this has been one of the most painful and traumatic events of your life. But this is a large community and there are others of us, as might be expected, and that's okay. For others of you, you may have a different experience entirely. You may not have known a sad joy, and you register a more vague sadness. I mean, you're sad about it, but you didn't know her, and so you're wondering, how do I feel in the midst of that? I mean, clearly I see others who are feeling deep grief and loss. For you, maybe there's a sense that you should be feeling more. If this describes you, our prayer is that the strength that you have in this less acute sadness would be offered to this community as a way to hold, comfort, and nurture those who grieve and mourn this loss more directly than you. As followers of Christ, it is central to our vocation to grieve with those who grieve and mourn with those who mourn in community, which means that we might not always feel it to the depths of our bones, but we can have compassion and grace and presence flesh and blood, giving Christ to one another, giving witness to the risen reality, the incarnate reality of Jesus Christ. And so regardless of where you find yourself this, on this pendulum, it is our hope that you can discern the work of the Spirit this day. And you'll notice that joy's passing for you is possibly for all of us, an opportunity, an open door to begin processing loss in general. This may, be joy, this may be joy's death for you that you need to process this loss. This may be a death or a significant loss that you've already experienced in the past, but it's kind of laying dormant in your life. 
This experience, our experience as a community, this is an open door for you to begin processing. The Spirit is inviting us. And this is what I personally have noticed in the last couple of weeks. I've been in conversation and conversation after this, and some people know and feel directly that pain, and others say, I didn't know her, but you know what, this is beginning to remind me of that loss that I experienced elsewhere. And so for us as a community, this is something that the Spirit of God has put on our laps, and we embrace it, what he's doing. Both experiences are an invitation from the Spirit of God. And so that's why we are so honored that Dr. Marybeth Iki is joining us this morning. Dr. Iki has been a psychologist for 25 years and specializes in resolving loss and trauma. So for many years now, she's been helping folks work their way through hard feelings of depression, grief, loneliness, shock, numbness, deep anger. All of these things often accompany trauma and loss. She's the author of a book, Shattered Hopes, Renewed Hearts, What to Do with Wishes That Don't Come True. But more importantly, Dr. Iki has a personal connection to our Haseyat Joy, Nagash, which she will describe in a moment. In particular, though, she has helped, she's interested in helping us navigate these key emotions, the emotion of shock, the emotion of sadness, the emotion of anger, and what's called survivor's guilt. And so we are deeply indebted to have her responding to this request, joining us on rather last minute um, basis. Often our, our speakers are, are sort of scheduled months in advance. And so it's with open hearts that we welcome Dr. Maribeth Iki. Thank you so much. I have the great privilege of having two daughters from Ethiopia, one of whom is Mechidus, freshman at Biola. Some of you know her. And I had uh, another privilege in actually getting to meet Joy at an orientation dinner with Mechidus this past fall. She came to our table full of life and full of smiles, and I instantly liked her, and I felt it was a God thing that we got to meet her among hundreds of people. And I felt excited for Mechidus about the Ethiopian connection. The next thing I knew, mid-January, Mechidus was in her room sobbing. I went in to see what on earth was wrong, and Joy had died on a mission trip to India. And here we are, none of us wants to be here, trying to figure out how to mourn the loss of Joy. But thank you for inviting me into your grief. It's good to be here. This, this information, as Chad said, is for those who are suffering deeply over the loss of joy, for those who are having other losses triggered through the loss of joy, and simply for those who want to know how to show up in grief to help people. I want to start with a framework that can get you through grief. First, feel the feelings with friends and find meaning in the loss in Christ. The grief will get better with time. Maybe six months to a year, maybe longer. Grief will begin to settle down into warm, lovely memories about joy. And you're stronger, and you embrace life more fully for having known and loved and lost joy. But the grief does come first. Feel your feelings with friends and find meaning in Christ. In this 20 minutes today, I've been asked to focus especially on feeling your feelings. And I want to start with a scene from a movie that I love that well illustrates grief. Back in the day, there was a movie called Steel Magnolias. And in the movie, a mom loses her daughter. When the daughter was at the cusp of life, 
full of possibilities, just like Joy was. The Steel Magnolias were a motley crew of women, quirky, fun-loving, deep friends with a lot of history. And there was a scene between the mother and her daughter. The daughter had just gotten married. Naturally, she wanted to have kids, but there was a problem. She had diabetes, and she risked dying if she got pregnant. Naturally, the mom didn't want her to get pregnant and take that risk. And so they're going at it, as moms and daughters sometimes do. And the daughter says, Mom, I had rather have 30 minutes of wonderful than a lifetime of nothing special. That's a statement full of courage. Wanting to live fully in spite of risk. It reminds me of joy. I didn't know her well, but it seems to me, passionately following God's call to India, that she was living so fully in spite of risk. In the movie, the daughter has a son and dies, just as the mother feared. There is a scene where the mother is at the gravesite of her daughter. We are with her in the anguish of losing a child. Her friends, drifting away, realize that the mother is alone in a horrible moment, and they come back, as friends do. Mom says, I'm so angry I could punch somebody. One friend puts another out there and says, Hear her! Punch her! <laughs> you go from sadness to anger to laughter in a moment's time. And you have great hope <clears throat> that this mother will be able to work through the grief to living and loving fully again because she's feeling the feelings with friends and finding meaning in the loss, which in her case was raising her grandson. That's the point of feeling the feelings with friends and finding the meaning. It's to get through the grief and, and fully live and love again. So, feeling the feelings. I'm going to focus, as Chad said, on four feelings, shock, sadness and weeping, anger, and guilt. First, shock. Death is shocking, especially when it happens to someone young. I don't pretend to know what the team that was with Joy was feeling, but I'll tell you what I imagine I would feel in those circumstances. I would be jet-lagged, very tired. I would be in culture shock, disoriented, excited about the new stuff, but disoriented. And then there just wouldn't be words to describe the shock that I would go into if a young team member died. Shock is a first feeling people often feel facing death, and it feels like this. It's a huge sense of being disoriented. You can feel detached from yourself, like part of you is looking on, while the other part just goes through the motions. Numb, you can feel a little shaky, fly away, ungrounded. It's surreal like you can't believe this is happening. And as you look around and the sun is shining and people are going on about their business, you just can't believe that life is going on like normal because your life just turned so upside down. Shock is a profoundly unsettling sense that life will never be the same again. It's very disconcerting and a very normal response to death, initially and later. 
So I want to talk about how to deal with it. A couple things to do when you're feeling shock. Feel the feeling with friends. Tell a couple friends you're feeling shocky. Now, I know some of you will love this, some it will sound silly, but it works with shock. Go outside, take your shoes off, Feel the ground against your feet, feel the grass against your toes, look at the sky, take in the blueness, feel the breeze, lean against a tree, feel the solidness of the trunk and the bark. Take in your physical environment with as many of your senses as you can, sight, smell, touch, hearing. This is called grounding and orienting and it really helps with shock. Say you're in a classroom and you start feeling shocky. Be in your desk, be aware of your body in your desk, feel your feet against the floor, your seat against the seat, your back against the back. Focus on those parts of the body that are in direct contact with the environment and that helps ground you and is an antidote to the shock. And then, after you've done that, do some orienting. Orienting means you look around the room, you see the people, you let your eyes go where they want to go, you take in the people, the teacher, the walls, any pictures, you see where your eyes want to land. Notice the object. What drew you to it? Just let your eyes and awareness be there. Focusing on the physical environment around us can bring us back from kind of a downward spiral and ground us in the here and now, which is so helpful for shock. Okay, second feeling, sadness and weeping. In the Gospel of John, chapter 11, we have the shortest sense verse in the Bible. Do you know it? Jesus wept. He was weeping over the death of his dear friend, Lazarus. Commentators have theorized about Jesus weeping, some, in my opinion, explaining it away but I believe the people who were present with Jesus knew exactly why he was weeping. Seeing him weep, they said, behold how he loved him. Behold how he loved Lazarus. If you weep over the loss of joy, it is not because you, you're weak or your faith is weak, it's simply because you loved her. And aside, and Chad has referred to this, but if you are not a weeper, please don't take this to mean that you did not love joy or someone that you lost. There is no right or wrong way to grieve. Some people get stone cold in deep grief and don't weep. We need to be very tender with each other in grief and not judge our ways of grieving. But if you do weep over the loss of joy, it's not because you're weak or your faith is weak, it's because you really loved her. How to be with each other in the weeping. A man who had written a lot on love had a contest about picking the most loving child. There was a four-year-old with a neighbor an old man whose wife had died. The little boy went next door to be with his neighbor and snuggled up with him and sat on his lap. He came home and his mother asked, what did you say to him? The little boy said, nothing. I helped him cry. This was the child who won the contest help each other cry or feel whatever feelings you're feeling. Ask, how are you feeling today? Hug, sit with, weep with those who weep 
if you can. Don't give Kleenex to wipe the tears away. The point is to be with each other in the messiness of the grief. Don't try to have magic words to make it all better. There are none. One other aside, and I just feel it's important to say this, grief can get complicated. Sometimes you weep not over the person you lost, per se. Maybe you didn't have a close relationship with them. So you weep over the relationship that you wished you had had with them, and now you know you can never have it because they've died. This, too, is very legitimate grief. This work of weeping and feeling the feelings of grief is actually quite difficult and draining. It takes time and energy. Think running a marathon and pare down your schedule to provide space for it. We don't give the emotional work the credit we need to. You may be in class, minding your own business, taking notes, and a professor makes a random comment that triggers memories of joy and boom, you're fighting back tears. Let professors and friends know that you're dealing with grief and clear out space for it. Third feeling, anger. Anger is a necessary part of grief, and it's okay to feel it. I'm going to deal with anger at God and anger at the person who has died. Martha and Mary both said the exact same thing to Jesus when Lazarus died. Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. Unstated there, I hear, you could have been here. Why on earth weren't you? We thought you loved us. I'm not sure they were angry per se, but I think they were on the anger continuum here. They were protesting, questioning God, definitely disappointed. And what Jesus did not say to the sisters was, I am the Son of God, the Messiah. How dare you question my perfect timing? Rather, he tenderly explained to Martha about eternal life, and he wept. If you are hesitant about bringing your anger or protest or questioning to God about a devastating loss, such as the loss of joy, I want you to remember Jesus' response to the sisters, tenderly explaining and weeping. God does not condemn us for being devastated over the loss of loved ones. Not even when that devastation includes anger and protest and questioning. Just please don't leave the dialogue with God. Keep on bringing your anger and questions to him. That's what a real relationship with God looks like. Often we also get angry at the person who died. This gets complicated. Say someone really special and important to you that you loved dearly and deeply dies. In dying, they leave you. They don't want to leave you, but they do leave you, and it feels like abandonment. After you've worked through the shock and deep grief, you may well come to a place where you feel abandoned by them, and abandonment triggers anger. The dilemma is, the person didn't want to die and didn't want to leave us, and it feels very unfair to get angry at them when they've already suffered death. So what do we do with the anger? Often we shut it down, pretend it's not there, ignore it. The problem is, if we shut down anger, we shut down all feelings, and we shut down the grief process. We don't get to be selective with our feelings. Either we feel whatever comes up, 
or we shut them down. And we can't feel our feelings through to the end of the grief process if we shut even just the anger down. To give yourself permission to be angry, imagine writing a letter. Again, share it with friends, a counselor, a spiritual director. But the letter might say, I am angry at you, and I am so sorry. But you left me, and I loved you, and counted on you, and life is so different without you. I'm so angry I could punch somebody, and you aren't even here to punch. And I feel horrible, because you didn't want to die, and you don't deserve my, ang my anger. But there you have it, I am angry. Whoever the person you loved and lost is, I'll bet they would understand your anger and the messy mix of feelings. And I'll bet that they would also understand that behind the anger is a bucket load of love. Fourth and final feeling, guilt. Often we feel guilty when someone close to us dies. Why did Joy die and not me? Why did my sister, my brother, my mother die and not me? This guilt is so common, it has a name, survivor guilt. We can also feel guilty as though we should have, could have done something to prevent the death. Guilt is natural, but we need to resolve it because it can lead to depression. Your loved one's death was not your fault. <clears throat> the guilt is totally false, and yet it can feel so very compelling. And without even realizing it, we start doing penance for the guilt. And the penance looks like this. We stop living fully. The person who died doesn't get to live, I won't live either. They don't get to marry and have kids, I won't either. They don't get to enjoy laughter and fun, great food and graduating from college, I won't either. Your life goes into freeze frame. You're no longer stepping out and enjoying it like you used to because guilt is making you do penance for a loss that really, really wasn't your fault. First thing I'd like you to know, it really, really wasn't your fault. The death wasn't because you didn't pray enough, you weren't there enough, you didn't call 911 quick enough, it wasn't your fault. We are sadly powerless to stop death. Get with friends who will keep telling you it's not your fault until you know it deep inside. Second thing I'd invite you to do with the guilt. Add a couple lines to the letter you started about the anger. The lines may go like this. I can't stand it that you died, and I can't go forward and enjoy all the, all the things that you're now missing out on. I can't, I won't. Honestly consider, how would the person who died respond? My guess is that Joy and most of the people that we've loved would heartily say, live, live fully. Life is so incredibly short. Go for it. Go for it for both of us. To conclude, and then Chad will come back up, grieve fully. The loss of joy and any losses that joy's death is bringing up that you're realizing you haven't been able to grieve fully. Feel the feelings with friends, 
spiritual director, counselor as well, and find the meaning in the loss in Christ. And God will help you to experience fully the promise in Psalm 35, verse five. Weeping may last for a night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. The shout of joy really does come. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.